called iMac. What's that? Oh, the you know a laptop, a notebook. The M1, the M, the M1 processor. What the the new, the latest one. Right. Okay, Xiao Hua. Now it's uh, it's it's time. Are you ready? Yes, yes, I'm ready. Um, but if you can uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, now I share screen later. I'll give it to you. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, uh, I will say good morning and many colleagues from Asia, East Asia and South Asia. And good afternoon, some from uh, Western Coast, uh, California, US and good evening in uh, East Coast of US. I'm very sorry for our European colleagues. Now is the uh, earlier, very earlier morning, two to three a.m. So, but you can watch the recorded version. So today, I'm uh, very happy to invite Professor Xiao Hua Wang from uh, University of New South Wales, Capella, uh, Australia. Come here talk about the human impact on coasts. What has go gone right and wrong? So this is our World River and the Delta series source to sync webinar series. Uh, this is the 2021 number 46. And last year we have uh, 35. This will already have 45 or it totally we already have 80. So today show fast talk will number total number number 81. So as I mentioned, all our previous talk, including this one, is recorded live stream on our YouTube channel. So if you like to rewatch, you can watch our YouTube channel. Of course, I know many of our Chinese colleagues, they cannot watch it directly on the YouTube. You can watch on the Billy Billy website. And uh, so if you, uh, we will post it on Chinese WeChat. And this is the, and so, uh, Next, next Wednesday, um, uh, Chris uh, Hackney from uh, 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 the, the Newcastle University, UK, he will come here talk about the risks and impacts of sand mining in the lower Mekong River Delta. So please mark your calendar. Next week, we will back to the normal time, the Wednesday, and uh, as you see, it's the Beijing 9 p.m. The U.S. Easter Coast will be 9 a.m. So we're back to our normal webinar series time. So uh, Professor Xiao Hua, and graduate from Ocean University of China in Qingdao and uh, hold a PhD in physical oceanography from James Cook University in Australia. He is the core leader of the Sino Australian Research Consortium of Coastal Management, University of New South Wales, Australia. And also he served as associate editor for Estuarine Coastal and Shelf Science and uh, Luminology and Oceanography. So um, he was uh, the director of the International Student Recruitment and Exchange Program in uh, on his campus. And as I said, also the founder director of the Sino Australia Research Center for Coastal Management. Over the past 30 years, and uh, he teaches uh, both the undergraduate stu student and the graduate student. His research mainly is modeling of the ocean circulation, sediment transport, understanding of coastal management issues. I remember the first time I noticed Xiao Hua is uh, his paper on the Adriatic Sea. Uh, he published a, a paper modeling the Pearl River derived sediment to the transport in Mike modeling. So, uh, so Xiao Hua, uh, now is your turn. Please share your screen. Okay. Thank you, Paul, for for your contribution, uh, for your introduction. Um, and I must say that um, 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 I'm very honored to be invited to give um, a talk in this uh, excellent uh, um, World River Delta System Source to Sink webinar series. Um, I think it's a great program. Um, it um, it, during this challenging time, it, this webinar series is able to, um, you know, get international 
um, science community together um, to discuss, to uh, exchange, and to um, um, communicate uh, um, their um, research activities. So um, thank you, um, Paul, um, for your initiative and your, your time and effort um, in organizing um, this great um, webinar series. So my talk today is um, on human impact on um, coasts, um, what has gone right and the wrong. My name is Shoha Wang I'm from um, Sarkin, the University of New South Wales. Um, essentially, this is um, this presentation is a summary, summary of my um, perhaps last uh, five, 10 years um, research in the in area of uh, estuary and, and, and coastal oceanography. Um, <clears throat> particularly pay attention to how the human activities affect our coastal environment. As we know that Anthropogene is a period um, we are currently in, and this is time during which um, the human activity has significantly uh, altered the natural environment. And we know that coastal environments are key locations for transport, commercial, residential, and defense infrastructure and provide conditions suitable for economic growth. And they also fulfill important cultural, recreational, aesthetic needs and have intrinsic ecosystem service values. So for example, more than 80 percent Australians um, here live within 50 kilometers of the coast, while in China, 60% of people live in 12 coastal provinces. And China obviously is <clears throat> probably the most populous nation on this planet. So as a result, many world estuaries and coastal environments are under tremendous stress in response to increasing anthropogenic forcing and the Cause climate change. So, our ability to understand and predict coastal oceans has become vital in humanity's effort to restore and pro protect these habitats and the ecosystem from further environmental degradations, even catastrophe, and to ensure ecologically sustainable development in coastal zones. So, <clears throat> I'm going to use uh, several studies to actually um, demonstrate uh, and the document how um, human activities are affecting our coastal environment. But before I uh, start, um, I want to actually show you that um, in, in, two, in, in, in 2015, I've hosted an international workshop on sediment dynamics of muddy coast and estuaries. Um, over 100 uh, international research um, researchers, um, including um, estuarine physicists, um, coast oceanographers and engineers, um, got together in a three days uh, conference and the three hour, three days debating, discussion, and the communication, we produced an, a report published in the ECSS as an editorial. In that report, we articulated several major anthropogenic forcing agents that we, we should uh, pay attention to uh, because they are significantly changing our uh, coastal environment. The first one is the land reclamation and the hardening of the coastlines um, of our coastal oceans. The second one is a dramatic reduction in sediment discharge from our major rivers. The third one is the navigation channel construction and the deepening of the ports and the impact on our um, estuaries. And lastly, the increased nutrient and contaminant loading to the estuary and the coastal environment. So uh, I'm going to use uh, four studies, as I said, to demonstrate those uh, changing environment on the <coughs> influence of this human activities. The first one is the island building activity. And uh, um, 
and I'm going to use this Yangshan Harbor um, construction project as a case study. Second study is on how dike and seawall construction affects uh, estuaries and, and sediment transport dynamics and, and the siltation erosion of uh, coastal environment. And I'm going to use um, a deep water navigation channel in Shanghai port in China as an example. And third one is um, on tidal uh, flat reclamation. Again, I'm going to use um, two uh, case studies, one located in Jiangsu coast in China, Yellow Sea, and another one is Jiaozhou Bay <coughs> near a northern uh, Chinese city of Qingdao. And finally, <coughs> I'm going to use Darwin Harbor as in a case study to evaluate and investigate how channel and the marine jargon affects water quality in our estuarine systems. So, <clears throat> uh, Yangshan Harbor <coughs> project. Um, Yangshan Harbor is a man made island constructed on the Chichu archipelago in China, and it's located at the conjunction of the Changjiang River estuary and the Hangzhou Bay, about 30 kilometers um, from Shanghai. So Shanghai is uh, somewhere here, um, Yang, uh, Changjiang River estuary, Hangzhou Bay, and Yangshan Harbor is somewhere here. The archipelago has a complex coastlines with 69 islands. So this is the archipelago. The islands <coughs> form two chains with a, <coughs> a northern chain island, island chain called Xiaoyangshan, and a southern island chain of, uh, called uh, um, Daiyangshan. Um, <coughs> Between these two uh, island chains, uh, there is a wide but shallow um, west entrance. Um, the width is probably something like uh, um, eight kilometers um, with a 10 meters uh, average water depth. But in the east entrance, we have a uh, much narrower but deeper um, east entrance. And that um, width of entrance is about one kilometer. And um, 85 uh, meters uh, water depths. Um, the construction of the Yangshan Harbor started in 2002 and completed in 2008, which had three phases with, with at least one channel close at each face. So here we have a first dam, a first phase uh, channel closure, second dam, and a third dam. Uh, to satisfy the harbor's land demand, reclamation occurred in each phase. So, for instance, the first wharf, the second wharf, and the third wharf. Also, some reclamation activity also occurred um, in, um, in Daiyangshan uh, Island chain, uh, indicated by this uh, white. Uh, patches uh, here. The observed seabed change um, from 1998 to 2008 around the Yangshan Harbor is shown here as well. So <clears throat> the red color indicates um, the decrease of uh, water depths, obviously due to siltations, and the blue indicates uh, depth increase um, and you can see mainly inside of this harbor along the navigation channel here. There is some dredging taking place during the construction period. However, near the entrance, no, no dredging activity was, um, was undertaken. But one can see that um, for most of the harbor, the depth is increased. And this increase uh, of depth is up to three meters um, 
in total. Whereas, of course, there is some uh, decrease of the um, water depths on the northern side of um, Xiaoyang San Island after the um, construction of the project. And that um, deposition uh, caused the um, decrease of depths up to three uh, meters as well. So, <clears throat> um, what has happened? The study that we undertook, and it's mainly based on um, ocean modeling, shows that um, the stronger tidal choking happened at the Easter entrance here after um, island building activity. And that stronger tidal choking produced a jet, essentially tidal currents, in a longer and narrower Easter entrance. So the coastline is longer because the island building and the width of the east entrance uh, is also reduced due to this island building activity. So <clears throat> a stronger <clears throat> tidal currents here can be demonstrated by this uh, M2 current difference before and after the harbor construction. And we can see that in the Easter, uh, the um, Eastern entrance along the channel, the tidal currents of M2 increased up to 30 centimeters per second. And that stronger tidal currents can resuspend the sediments from a seabed shown in this plot, which is the sediment concentration and the surface flood current after the construction of the harbour and before construction of the harbour. And we can see that a strong currents produced a strong sediment resuspension. That is not there before the construction. So because of the island building which connects these island chain of the, of the northern side of the harbour and that strengthened the tidal choking phenomena and therefore a stronger tidal currents is produced at the Easter entrance, especially along the navigation channel. And that was a process that ensured the harbour has a natural erosive um, navigation channel. And that's good news for port management because then we don't really need to um, judging this place as often as they required. However, in contrast, my second study is a deep water, deep water navigation channel construction in Shanghai port. Um, and that is uh, at the um, entrance of uh, Changjiang River um, estuary. Um, Changjiang River estuary is a multi-channel estuary with uh, three level bifurcations and the four outlets of Northern Branch, uh, Northern Channel, South Channel, uh, North Passage and the South Passage. Separated by shores such as um, Hensa Shore and the Jodensa Shore and some islands like Tomi Island. Um, the construction of the deep navigation, deep water navigation channel or DNC started in 1998 and was completed in 2011. The project created 92 kilometers long channel with the water depths of 12.5 meters below the mean lowest low water. So this channel along the uh, south, cha um, south channel and north passage. Um, in addition, two dikes of 48 kilometers in south and 49 kilometers north, and the um, 19 groins see on this picture here, with a total length of 30 kilometers, were constructed to increase current speed and the decrease sediment deposition in the North Passage. 
to protect this uh, deep water navigation channel. In order to <coughs> facilitate um, the study, these, uh, the channel has been uh, named from cell A of the upstream to cell uh, X of the downstream. And I'll refer those uh, locations with those cell numbers um, <coughs> in the next few slides. Since completion of the first phase, and that's um, between 1998 and 2000, a silting problem began to attract attention as the annual amount of deposit to be dredged to maintain the DNC was far greater than the original estimate of 30 million meter cube. So this table shows annual dredging rate or siltation volume from 2002 to 2008 for the navigation channel. As one can see that by 2005, the <coughs> siltation volume has reached 36 millimeter cube. And that's already exceeded the projected 30 millimeter cube um, dredging rate um, as predicted. And that dredging rate is increased from 2005 um, every year of 2006, of 42, 2007, 61, and 2008, 56. This plot shows the siltation rate distribution from the upstream of the channel to the downstream of the channel along these uh, cell numbers for <clears throat> three years of 2004, 2005, and 2008. One can see that most of the dredging or the siltation occurs in the middle of the <clears throat> navigation channel between cell um, H to cell N. However, the fluvial bedlow sediment has been reduced dramatically due to extensive um, hydro engineering projects in the river basin, such as Three Gorges Dam, which acts as sediment traps. So this plot shows the annual sediment discharge rate measured at a Datong station upstream of uh, Changjiang River uh, from 1960s um, to 2010. And one can see that uh, from 1997, when the Three Gorge Dam uh, is completed, the annual sediment discharge rate is um, gradually decreasing. Therefore, the mass of the observed um, deposits in the DNC is more as a result of redistribution of sediment due to local erosion and the deposition than of the direct input of the sediment from the river. <clears throat> Two questions should be asked here. First one, what is the dynamics that drives the sediment transport in Changjiang River estuary, and the two, how does the DNC construction impact the sediment distribution and the siltation? To address these two questions, <clears throat> we developed a wave current sediment coupled ocean model for the Changjiang River estuary. This movie shows the model simulated bottom currents and salinity from a spring to neat tidal cycles of seven days. The color indicates the salinity and the vector indicates the tidal currents. Density driven, density currents driven by the horizontal salinity gradient was the vector high salinity water upstreams of the navigation channel, resulting in a salt intrusion into the DNC. And that is more pronounced during the neap tide than spring tide because mixing is much weakened during the spring tide. So let me show the <clears throat> movie again. So the currents of the tides, flat ebb is denoted by these uh, black arrows. So flooding currents upstream, 
our tyrants uh, downstreams, and this density current form <coughs> forms this salt wedge inside the navigation channel represented by this red color of high salinity. So we can see that uh, during spring tides, this uh, salt wedge is more developed uh, than, um, than, than the spring tide because the stratification is a lot stronger. And by the way, that salt wedge actually stops somewhere in the middle of the navigation channel. And you probably remember that's where most of the dredging was taking place. So the DNC varies between a well mixed uh, estuary during spring tides and a highly stratified estuary during the neap tides. This can be demonstrated by the figures on the right, which show tidal average salinity and the salinity concentration along the channel during the spring and neap tide, respectively. So this is a long channel section from upstream to downstream. And this is water depths. This is the spring tide. This is neap tide. The white lines is iso hay lines, a color as sediment concentration. Um, during spring tide, an estuary turbidity maxima or ETM is developed in the middle of the channel, surrounded by cell O. And this ETM is further developed into a fluid mud layer during the neap tide, occupy the entire down channel section. The source of the sediment forming the ETM is from upstream foreign sediments located in Hunsa and the Jiudansa shores. This is represented by the figures on the left, which shows the tidal average sediment flux and the concentration at the bottom during the spring and neap tide, respectively. Due to shallow water in those uh, shore waters of Hunsa and the Jiudansa, our sediments are resuspended by strong wave current interactions there, and they're transported into the DNC by the residual current through the east DNC outlet. And so during the neap tide, that transport is, is enhanced because residual currents or density currents is stronger, as I said. So resuspension of the sediments of the Hunsa and the Jiudansa is being transported by residual currents and then into the navigation channel. This plot shows the <coughs> development of um, a fluid mud layer from <coughs> the ETM. And it shows a <coughs> cross section from upstream to downstream and the variation of sediment concentration indicated by the color with time. And uh, one can see that, so this white line is um, tidal elevation from spring time to neap time. And one can see that ETM is developed somewhere near cell O, and it moves up and down with flood and ebb currents. And as it moves towards the um, spring tide, fluid mud is developed, and that occupies entire down, um, downstream channel, um, as one can see here. Um, so, so that's basically is this uh, fluid mud layer uh, showing in this plot B. Okay, so <clears throat> now we have the third study, and that is on impact of um, land reclamation in Jiangsu Coast and the Jiaozhou Bay. Between um, 1949 and 2002, Reclamation has already turned approximately 12,000 kilometers squared of coastal wetland into industrial and farming lands. And that's about 55% of total coastal wetland in China. The table shows annual reclaimed coastal area in China from 2002 to 2011. 
totally a thousand kilometers squared um, tidal flat areas, along with the GDP uh, growth rate of China. We can clearly see that when you have a stronger GDP, you need more resources such as land use, and therefore reclamation activity is, is stronger. In 2010, the Chinese central government approved a major project that would reclaim over 2,000 kilometers of tidal flats on the Jiangsu coast, shown by this green patch here of Jiangsu coast uh, tidal flat. The tidal flat is 100 kilometers wide and 100 kilometers long. And during the <clears throat> low tide, the tidal flat is exposed showing complex um, coastal geomorphological features such as tidal channel. <clears throat> tidal flats have three functions affecting tidal dynamics. The first one is the, the tidal flat store tidal energy. And the second one is it actually dissipate tidal energy. And the third one, is generation of shallow water tides. Tidal flats store tidal energy both in potential as well as uh, connected for, uh, energy form during the flood tides and release it during the ebb tides. The energy, energy storage can be demonstrated in this sketch. So when you, um, when you do not have uh, uh, reclamation tides uh, come in and uh, tidal energy is transported to the tidal flat when it's wet. And the instantaneous tidal energy stored can be plotted by this time series here. So this is time and this is tidal energy stored in a tidal flat, on a tidal flat. In a case when the tidal uh, flat reclamation took place, a wall would be built to reclaim um, tidal uh, flat on the land side. And therefore, this wall becomes a boundary condition which reflects incoming tides. Energy will be reflected uh, back into the tidal basin. So <clears throat> after <clears throat> reclamation, loss of these functions, um, affecting tides will induce a redistribution of this extra tidal energy, otherwise be stored on tidal flat. And that can be demonstrated by running two different um, tidal models experiments seen below. So we first run a, a standard case, let's call this case SD, with the wetting and the drying process for the Yellow and the East China Sea. Then we run a second case, let's call it case JS, in which all the tidal flat of the Jiangsu coast in case SD are removed from the water domain. Difference in M2 tidal energy flux between the case SD and the case um, JS is shown in this figure. The color indicates the magnitude difference between the cases, and the vector shows the direction difference between the cases. From the figure, the reclamation on the Jiangsu coast, uh, tidal flat of the Jiangsu coast, has following consequences. The extra tidal energy is transported to the east boundary of the Yellow Sea and as far as the Liaotong Bay. More importantly, the study shows that a maximum increase of the tidal range up to 85 centimeters will occur on the west coast of Korea, but a maximum decrease up to 80 centimeters in Hangzhou Bay. The sea level change will dwarf the current global mean sea level rise at the rate of 1.7 millimeters per year, and as a comparison, the IPCC predicts a global mean sea level rise um, in order of 40 centimeters by end of this century. So clearly, 
destruction and reclamation of tidal flats in coastal regions like Jiangsu Coast will result in immediate and more serious coastal impacts than those predicted by IPCC. It reduces the tidal bore in Hangzhou Bay that affects the tourism as millions of people visit Hangzhou Bay to watch Qiantang Tidal Bore during the Lunar Festival each year. It also reduces minimum depths of uh, Yangshan Harbor that we um, discussed in our first study. And it is a deep water port of 40 meters. That's affecting its shipping and navigation activity. Furthermore, the west coast of uh, Korea, showing here, is characterized by strong tides, shallow water depths, complicated coastlines, scattered islands, and extensive tidal flats. It has many low-lying cities and industrial centers, such as Incheon Airport, which is already susceptible to frequent flooding. Increase of tidal range as a result of reclamation of uh, tidal flats, the Jiangsu coast will enhance these coastal hazards such as storm surge, inundation, and uh, <clears throat> especially for these um, low lying areas along that coastline. So, <clears throat> a second case study on this land reclamation is um, reclamation of tidal flats in um, a small embayment called Jiaozhu Bay near the uh, city of uh, Qingdao in northern China. Um, this map shows the coastline changes due to um, land reclamations. Uh, from 1935 by this uh, blue line to um, 2013, shown by this purple line. In 2013, a cross bay bridge called Jiaozhu Bay Bridge was also um, constructed. Due to reclamations of these tidal flat, and that caused the coastline changes, it has reduced the um, water area of Jiaozhu Bay by about 40% from 550 kilometers square to about now 360 kilometers square. As a result, tidal prison of the bay is also decreased and the artificial coastline uh, length increased. <clears throat> As a result of uh, coastline changes and reformation of the um, tidal flats, especially in the um, head of the bay, the water turbidity in the bay is reduced significantly. These four uh, satellite image uh, taken by uh, Landsat has shown that surface turbidity uh, in 2000, in 1980s, for instance, 1984 and 1986 to um, 2000, um, and 2006. These are measured at the same um, tidal face, and one can see that, especially this, uh, this two plots here, that surface turbidity uh, value is much reduced in 2006 than 1986. Uh, 1980, um, yeah, that's right, 1986. Um, Another observation was that after the construction of the uh, Jiaozhu Bay Bridge, um, sea ice is frequently formed in the uh, northern uh, part of the bay beyond that uh, cross bridge, indicating a reduced um, water exchange maximum between the bay and open um, shelf water. So <clears throat> what has caused this uh, reduction of um, sediment concentration in Jiaozhou Bay and why there's a reduction of the water exchange um, after all these reclamation activities took place? To answer those questions, 
Again, we set up uh, uh, tidal models <clears throat> that simulate M2 and M4 tides for these five different years from 1935, 66, 86, 2000, 2008, with different coastal lines and a tide flat distribution. And one can see from the first panel here that um, due to reclamation and coastline changes, the M2 tide amplitude has decreased by about 10% from 1.4 meters to about 1.3 meters in 2008. However, for M4 tides, the amplitude of M4 tide is increased up to 100% from a value of about 0.14 meters to now about point, um, 0.3 meters, point, perhaps 0.26 meters. We also simulated the depth average uh, sediment concentration and sediment flux um, in those five different years from 35 to 2008. One can see that the sediment concentration is gra gradually reducing from 35 to 2000, sediment concentration is represented by the color. And the sediment flux was um, seaward in 1935, represented by these uh, black arrows. However, in 2008, the sediment flux becomes landward. The sediment flux um, variability with um, reclamation or coastline changes uh, for those 70 years can also be demonstrated uh, on these uh, plots here. We look at uh, two cross sections. Uh, one is section one and one is uh, cross section two. And we calculate uh, sediment flux for these cross sections and separate those total sediment flux um, into seven different components using Dye's formula. Because this is a monthly average or tidal average the sediment flux, therefore, this uh, Dye um, formula composition can help us to understand which component dominates these uh, net sediment flux. And, when, and then we plot those uh, sediment flux according to these different components. And uh, for different years with different colors on this uh, bar chart. So we can see that the tidal pumping, which is the term T3 to T5, tidal pumping dominates the net sediment flux for the cross section one. And uh, we can see that in 1935, um, the seven flux is largely uh, seaward, but by the time when we reach 2008, the seven flux is almost reduced to zero. So <clears throat> 2008 seven flux is indicated by this um, yellow uh, color here. And that is also reflected to the net sediment flux from 1935 to now 1930, um, 2008. And that trend also occurs in this cross section two, which shows a largely seaward sediment flux. So moving sediment, sediment moves offshore like that. And uh, a, in 2008, the sediment flux is landward, meaning it's moving towards the land. <clears throat> if we separate our um, tidal flat of Jozo Bay into 10 equaling components, denote, denoted by A1 to A10, so each of these uh, <clears throat> area or zone has <clears throat> equaling size, roughly equaling to 10% of total tidal flat, and we remove these uh, uh, tidal uh, flat zones from A1 to A10 from head to the mouth. 
and the calculate set in flux of section one and section two and plotted this, uh, their values in these two plots here. And A is for section one and the B is for section two. So when we'll see that as the accumulation percentage um, increases from 10% to 100%, the total sediment flux denoted by the spring line changes from negative or seaward to positive when it reaches 100% reclamation. And that also happens in plot B for cross section two. So at 10% reclamation, removing only one of those boxes of A1 is negative, something like uh, 150 um, uh, seaward. And then when it's all these tidal flats removed, it becomes um, slightly positive. So <clears throat> all these changes of sediment flux, in fact, is driven by um, this uh, phenomena called tidal asymmetry. Tidal asymmetry is determined by <clears throat> tidal components such as um, M2 tides and M4 tides, especially um, shallow water tides like M4 tides responsible to determine the degree of this tidal asymmetry. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, earlier, shallow water tides is generated or can be generated by tidal flats and are responsible for these tidal asymmetry in rise and fall durations of water elevation, which is manifested as an equality in flood ebb tidal current magnitudes. So flood dominance means the flood current is stronger and ebb dominance of tidal asymmetry means tidal currents App tidal currents is stronger. Regions with an increase in the fast rising tides caused by the destruction of tidal flats, flats may experience a net onshore sediment transport, resulting in severe siltation. Conversely, those regions which become more app dominant may become subject to increased erosion, possibly requiring greater maintenance of reclaimed land. So <clears throat> to investigate this tidal asymmetry, which can be indicated or parameterized by gamma, which is a function of the ratio between M4, M2 tide amplitude and their phase relationship, we removed the tidal flats presented in 1935 incrementally in a step of 10% of the total areas in two opposite directions. In the red model experiment and the blue um, model experiment. So in red, so this, <clears throat> this is um, uh, a gamma value or Bay averaged gamma values. Um, in red line, it indicates a model run by removing tidal flats from the head to the mouth whereas the blue is the opposite removing direction from the mouth to the heads. And one can see that the red line has significantly changed uh, gamma values as the percentage of tidal flat removal uh, increases from 10% to 100%, but blue line has not given as much as gamma change as <clears throat> the red line. The value here is positive, meaning for the Johto Bay, this is flood dominant uh, area, meaning sediment is being transported into the bay and obviously would cause um, the siltation. So, sorry. So um, the different trends of the rates of the change in gamma in two runs show that effect of the land reclamation 
on tidal symmetry gamma shown by this plot here, not only depends on the area reclaimed, so area, total area means the percentage of the tidal flats removed, but also on its location. For instance, if you remove the tidal flats of the head, you can change the tidal symmetry a lot more than if you remove the tidal flat near the mouth or the sides of the uh, tidal flat. Okay, so <clears throat> that <clears throat> moves my talk into my last <clears throat> study, and that is um, on Darwin Harbor dredging and dumping um, studies. In early 2000, a large uh, natural gas field was um, <clears throat> detected in Timor Seas in northern um, part of the Australia. This is Australia here, Timor, Timor, this is Timor Sea. And this natural gas field is named as each side field. It was determined that Darwin um, <clears throat> would be a site for onshore processing facilities. Therefore, harbor is being expanded in Darwin. So that one is somewhere here. And that is uh, <clears throat> East um, Wharf, such as loading zones and the birthing areas and the gas processing facilities, such as pipeline and liquid natural gas uh, plant. Darwin Harbor is a macro tidal environment with maximum tidal range reaching seven meters. It connects uh, a narrow channel, connects outer harbor and inner harbor with a depth up to 40 meters in the channel. And uh, inner, cha inner harbor has extensive tidal flat and uh, um, mangrove areas. And it also has the three um, River arms called East Arm, Middle Arm, and uh, <clears throat> West Arm. So <clears throat> East Arm Wharf was built uh, together with the LNGP uh, by reclaiming some of the um, tidal flat and mangrove areas in the East Arm. In order to <clears throat> Build the uh, wharf and uh, construct a navigation channel and also burying the pipeline. The dredging was taking place in these uh, blue areas. So, for instance, this is a pipeline route, and the dredging took place here for the East Arm navigation channel. And this photo shows uh, backhoe dredger, which is at work to judge the sediments in those locations. And one can clearly see that sediment plumes is produced during the dredging. And a spoil of dredging was transported to offshore in the outer Arc harbor dumped in this location here. So the study was to <clears throat> design an observational as well as a um, modeling campaign uh, to investigate how this dredging and the dumping activities, activities affects water quality, and in this case, certain concentrations in Darwin Harbor. <clears throat> this plot shows um, observed um, sediment concentration at the seven stations um, <clears throat> to sit situated outside of the um, Harbor or outer harbor and five inside the harbor, represented by these uh, white dots here. And the observation of this SSC or set concentration is at the bottom of uh, each station. Measures uh, concentration from um, 7th of November 2012 to 7th of December, covering two spring tidal cycles. 
one can see that uh, first spring tides produce much stronger sediment suspension than the second spring tide, except um, the station EA1, where sediment concentration appears to be stronger than the first spring tide. You will know that this um, unexpected signal of the stronger sediment concentration in EA1 during the second spring tide, in fact, <clears throat> not due to the natural sediment risk suspension by tidal currents, but it's due to <clears throat> dredging. And furthermore, we actually observed in EA2, station EA2, which is here, and a station CL and the CR, CL and the CR, some subtitle sediment concentration signals, like these spikes for both tidal, for the both spring tidal cycle or tidal period. As one can see also here in CL and CR of these subtitle signals. In order to understand the variability of the sediment concentrations, a sediment transport model was developed and the simulation produces um, red line, which largely matches observed value very well. However, it fails to match this um, second springtime uh, sediment concentration values. And as I said, you will learn that this is due to um, dredging activities because EA1 is where the dredging activities took place. And the model, of course, did not include dredging. However, the model also failed to produce those subtitle spikes of those spring uh, tides, and it failed to pre produce uh, predict these uh, subtitle uh, spikes in CL and CR as well. And there's a reason for that. So <clears throat> we run a, a model without any risk suspension, but <clears throat> mimic dredging by injecting a three kilograms per second um, near bottom seven flux near station e EA1. And the model produces a blue line, which shows now the second springtime seven concentration is much stronger than the original model run, meaning indeed the observed high sediment concentration value is due to the dredging. Furthermore, we now have this <coughs> subtitle spikes produced by the blue line in both spring tides, meaning the dredging activity here or in EA1 can also affect um, sediment concentration in EA2 which is probably five, six kilometers upstream. And that clearly is due to the transport by tidal current evaction. We still cannot produce this subtitle uh, spikes in CL and CR. However, we run a semi transport without, again, without the suspension but injecting um, 50 kilograms meter cube um, surface uh, set in flux at the dumping area. Now the purple line start to show the subtitle um, set in concentration uh, signals for both stations. So <clears throat> the dumping activity is here can affect certain concentrations in CL and CR due to, again, tidal current infection. And judging at EA1 can affect tidal, um, can affect certain concentration in um, EA2. So that means the judging and dumping activities not only uh, affects water quality locally, but also can affect water quality uh, remotely like this EA2 and the station CL and the C, um, CL and the CR. Now, 
um, northern part of Australia is subject to a uh, wet season monsoon. So this two plot shows the dry season and wet season of August and January wind climatology. During dry season in August, um, westerly wind dominates, whereas during the wet season, monsoon occurs and uh, the wind direction is reversed um, and becomes, um, becomes westerly. Sorry, this is easterly and this is westerly. Our measurements of the wind at the Darwin Harbour during <coughs> wet season 2012 and 13 and 13 and 12 also shows some monsoon events highlighted by this gray period. And during the monsoon period, sus sustained uh, northerly wind um, in order of 10 meters per second can be observed in both years. So <clears throat> when the <clears throat> monsoon uh, starts with northerly wind, it generates strong wave um, outer harbor because it has a um, it's less protected and has a long fetch. And this purple line shows um, the, sediment, uh, the wave height um, observed outside of harbor. And we can see that during the monsoon, it reaches a wave height up to two meters. And that wave will suspend the sediments with a uh, blue line indicate uh, sediment concentration in the uh, CL station. Due to the strong sediment resuspension, we have a strong sediment concentration, but um, the light attenuation can be significantly um, uh, increased. And therefore, the red line shows almost zero um, light during, the, um, <clears throat> during this period of monsoon. Observations of uh, sediment concentration also can be seen by these um, blue and green line um, measured outer harbor and the pink, red, and black line in, in the harbor in this plot. And one can see that during the um, monsoon uh, event, the sediment is much stronger in the outer harbor of blue and um, green line, but um, it's much weaker uh, inside the harbor. So oh, this modest um, satellite image also shows a, a strong uh, surface turbidity during the wet season 2013, especially in this dumping area. And we know that that was <coughs> due to, again, wave uh, rest suspension. Uh, because of strong waves driven by this uh, strong monsoon wind. So a conceptual model can be um, developed here for water quality of Darwin Harbour. The monsoon starts, it generates strong waves um, in the outer uh, harbour because of a stronger wind speed and a long wave fetch. And that <coughs> wave events we suspend the sediments in the outer harbour. Tidal pumping can actually move these sediments into the harbour and therefore move all these dumped sediment back into the navigation channels and the arms. So <clears throat> to conclude, um, we have used four different um, uh, studies to demonstrate how um, human activities affects um, our coastal environment. Yangsen Harbour is an island building activities. It increases uh, tidal choking, choking um, in the navigation channel and naturally um, uh, ensure a erosive uh, navigation channel and there's no need of extensive uh, judging. So from the port management point of view, it's a successful story. Whether this is a pure luck or whether it's a careful planning, we don't know. Deep water navigation channel in Shanghai Port 
port is a dike and seawall construction activities. And it increased um, estuarine stratification within the navigation channel and therefore strengthened the turbidity maxima. And that's where the uh, siltation occurred. And it's a failed uh, project because um, Port Authority requires 24 7 charging in order to <coughs> maintain 12.5 meters water depths for its navigation uh, purpose. Lesson learned is that um, we need to use three dimensional um, modeling study instead of two dimensional physical modeling because the high. Um, the baroclinic processes such as uh, stratification and mixing and the turbidity um, maxima in the um, salt wedge convergence zone cannot be um, <coughs> investigated by 2D studies. Jiaozhou Bay and Jiangsu Coast is tidal reclamation activities. In Jiaozhou Bay, increased tidal asymmetry and the tide, uh, flood dominance is increased. Therefore, um, Qingdao port um, is changed from erosion to uh, deposition. And also, reclamation of tidal flats of Jiangsu Coast can change tidal dynamics and cause um, increased storm surge and flooding. So, <coughs> science based integrated planning is needed. Um, in this case, as I demonstrated in Jiaozhou Bay, the location of reclamation determines. Um, um, the um, environmental impact. And of course, lastly, Darwin Harbor judging and dumping activities reduce water quality. And it's not clear as what um, this reduced water quality has impact on um, pelagic and the uh, benthic uh, ecosystem. And at long um, terms, um, and the largest scale observation program is needed. So my talk has hopefully told you a story about how some of those coastal environments responded to human induced perturbation in China and Australia. Our research also covers other sites around the world uh, shown in this slide. And these studies highlight a central challenge, namely how the world can meet ever increasing economic uh, drivers for use of coastal resources in an environmentally sustainable manner. This challenge is acknowledged by United Nations. The IOC of UNESCO has recently proclaimed a decade of ocean science for sustainable development, 2021-2030. International science community and their sponsors need to increase their investment in coastal research focused on human induced changes of sediment delivery, engineering modification of channels and the shorelines and input of nutrients, organic matter and the contaminants. We need to address these issues, not just at local, but at largest regional and global scales and also consider decadal and the longer time scales of which the environment respond to human alterations and climate change. And lastly, I, I need to thank uh, my group, my, uh, my PhD students of past and current, and my postdocs and collaborators, because without them, uh, these studies um, cannot be uh, conducted um, to such extent. Thank you, and back to you, Paul. Hey, Xiaohua, thank you so much. Wow, that's a lot of information. Thank you for giving us that, uh, you know, four to five case study. So I didn't realize what you showed except the, the Hangzhou Bay, the, uh, uh, the port project, the rest of them, basically you said human intervention uh, failure. So that's interesting. So let's see. Uh, the audience, do, if we, anybody have any question, please just go ahead. Uh, you can unmute yourself and go, go ahead directly ask Professor Wang. See anybody? Or you can, you know, 
just just unmute yourself. Go ahead. So let, let's while we are awaiting the the audience response, Xiaohua, uh, you didn't mention that much. Which kind of model you are using to do that kind of tide and sediment transport modeling? Use the Delft three D or or any um, other? Yes, um, we actually uh, um, use all different kind of models, um, such as um, 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 Princeton Ocean model, um, mm -hmm. Delft 3D, um, FVCOM. Mm -hmm. Our sediment trans model is based on um, our own uh, called UNSW uh, SED, uh, sediment transport uh, model. And that's an interesting model because it considers uh, <clears throat> high turbidity environments, such as mm -hmm. um, environment where um, we have fluid mud formations, and that is politically important um, in uh, turbidity coastal seas, such as uh, uh, China seas, as you know, um, in Yellow River estuaries, Yangtze River estuaries, or even Pearl uh, River estuaries. You know, turbidity is very high. And, uh, and often turbidity uh, would form uh, fluid mud layers. So <clears throat> our model cope with those uh, uh, high uh, sediment concentrations and how that affects the hydrodynamics, such as uh, mixing stratification processes um, and, uh, and, and, and the bottom bond layer dynamics. So okay. yeah, so that's... Um, I see, I see. Interesting. Okay, we have uh, the, the our uh, colleague, a friend from Bangladesh, uh, Shahidu Aslam. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my question is that uh, we can see that uh, because of the intervention in the Chinese part, there was a tremendous negative impact on the Korean part. Did it affect the political relationship between the two countries or how they responded because of this intervention? Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's right. You notice that. Um, yeah, there's a geopolitical significance uh, there. Um, um, so I, 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 one country's uh, um, coastal activities, such as reclamation, um, can actually affect um, um, in a, a far field. Uh, sites, uh, in this case, uh, Korea. Well, no one really uh, uh, knew that kind of uh, phenomenon before our study, obviously. Um, um, but, you know, um, but as, as you can see from my presentation, um, that makes sense because, um, because, because um, it's called the far field effect uh, of um, reclamation. It's just, essentially, it's a redistribution of uh, tidal energy uh, once you have removed a large area of um, a, a tidal flat, and, uh, and the energy, the tidal energy in this case, has to go somewhere. And it happens in Yellow Sea, it's um, uh, anti clockwise Kelvin wave. So, um, so sudden flux, uh, sorry, the um, tidal energy flux uh, moves this extra energy to. Um, to the eastern basin of the Yellow Sea. Um, how that affects uh, um, uh, this geopolitical, um, I think uh, draw, the, the study draws uh, um, scientists and the manage, coastal managers' attention in, in, in Korea. So I believe that uh, they are actually doing some monitoring to see um, <clears throat> to what extent uh, this uh, could happen. And uh, um, yeah, but I mean, same thing. I mean, the reclamation uh, activities in Korea and in Japan probably affects China as well. So, um, and their um, their extensive uh, reclamation activities took place in both of those countries uh, in seventies, eighties, and even nineties. So, um, yeah. So, but I mean, that's why I said you know we need to have uh, integrated scientific planning. We do not. Uh, um, we need to think. Uh, and a local activity perhaps could uh, affect um, a, a far field uh, site as well. Uh, it's just not um, uh, a local phenomenon. So a regional scale and a global scale is important as part of this uh, coastal estuarine study. I mean, that, that was a, 
uh, point I tried to uh, make um, towards the end of my talk. Okay, anybody else? Our Chinese friend, if you like, you even can ask any question, press one in Chinese. So, Xiaohua, you know, uh, I mh mean, your conclusion is very interesting because in U.S., for many uh, rural area, the undeveloped natural environment, the scientists try very hard, try to advocate, try to see don't overdeveloped. And uh, so we try to preserve the coast as a natural prime condition. So, because if anything happened, for example, hurricane, storm surge, if we have a natural doom, whatever it happened, it happened. It's a natural process. But if you overdeveloped, if you build a hotel, if you build the house, if you build so many structure there, the nature has its own way. And the hurricane will make landfall, just like what happened in New Orleans. And so we all pay a price. We hmm. cannot change nature. And so the idea we try to advocate here is we will leave a, leave a, a little bit buffer zone for the nature. So that's the idea. We always compare the New Jersey, Long Beach Island, and North Carolina. So we don't want to North Carolina repeat, you know, the mistake New Jersey made. But that's, you know, we still have a little bit of space to do that. But for the, for those uh, uh, urban area like Shanghai, like Shenzhen in China, you know, particularly those great Bay Area, they have no space, they already developed. And uh, so they have to make their harbor function. They have to build something to protect the coast. So that's a very difficult dilemma, as you see. And mm. uh, what do you think, you know, most of those human intervention actually have a negative impact. What's your suggest to the East Asia or South Asia country because so many population dwell on the coast? And the city. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's right. So um, I think the science is the key. Um, number one, to um, conserve and protect our environment, and number two, to restore the environment. You know, if, if we have to reverse this uh, change. Um, so, <clears throat> um, but I think. Let's say mitigation and restoration um, should be, be based on the scientific research because if we want, to, we want to change the system back to the original form, we need to actually understand what the original form or what the original equilibrium of, of those environments uh, uh, is first, right? Otherwise, how would you, you know, um, remediate or restore those uh, those systems. So, uh, <clears throat> so, so that's number one. So any um, remediation, um, restoration of those damaged coastal environment needs to first understand what was the original uh, system like. Um, number two is that the once you can actually develop, for instance, this Jozo Bay um, reclamation uh, project I mentioned, you know, if you actually reclaim the tidal flat in Jozo Bay in the sides of the bay or the near the mouth of the bay of the reclamation uh, of the tidal flats, you can create same area of land for economic activities. It will not change the environment in this case uh -huh. tidal yeah. as yeah. much as 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 otherwise you would and there's a reason behind it i, I couldn't really yeah yeah uh, have time to say that yeah, but you know 
So, so that's what I'm saying. So there's coastal development. Um, Good point. It should really be based on uh, scientific guidance and, uh, and minimize the impact. And once we have this impact, and if we want to restore, then again, science should be uh, taking place to actually see what original uh, uh, system is like and how you restore back from, you know, mm. it's basically you change the, all the interventions change the equilibrium of a system, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so you need to know what was original equilibrium and what is now and how you actually move back. For instance, you know, reclamation, again, you're using that activities. Do you actually, um, you know, put the tidal flats back? Uh, in which form? Uh, do you use, um, you know, what sort of materials do you use to actually uh, restore these tidal flats? Are they, can you use concrete or do you use sand? You know, all that kind of things. And I think exactly. all, need to be, all need to be actually, um, um, you know, based on science. So, so, so I, you know, let's say we want to remove all the, of the sea walls. And, and, and uh, but that's not just a simple thing, right? By removing sea walls and, and uh, it won't, it won't actually um, goes back to the original form. Um, that's true. Or for instance, in Jodhul Bay, because it needs a tidal flat, and tidal flat has certain slope, and it has uh, certain um, you know bottom geomorphological uh, characteristics, and all that has to be taken in the yeah. into consideration. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, very good. I think uh, you know we definitely need a more uh, observation and the numerical model. Can 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 play a very important role to to help understand the uh, the proposed change and and, but, the, and the long term observation. Yeah, you yeah. know the problem that we experienced um, with many of those studies we've taken by Sarkin is that um, there is not enough observations. Sure. You know, either uh, people don't want to share their model, um, their data, or it's just not there. And That's without uh, observations, um, it's very hard. So, so I, I, I would, I would emphasize, you know, establish collaborations for data sharing, some kind of database yeah, for the yeah, yeah. coastal well, areas. Okay, okay. Uh, here the last question actually from your campus. Uh, uh, Wasif uh, Ilahi. Hey, Ilahi, uh, do, do, do you want to uh, just uh, unmute and ask uh, Professor Wang? Hi, Professor Wang. Thanks for your nice presentations. Uh, I was just wondering, like, uh, as we all know, the GBM Delta, the Ganges Brahmaputra Magna Delta has a source of high sediment load from the upstream. So do you think, uh, the findings of the Jojo Bay land reclamations uh, are also applicable uh, in the Ganges, Brahmaputra, Magna Delta. Like uh, there are also some sort of land reclamations at the mouth of the Lower Magna Estuary. So, do you think the findings of the bay and the estuary environment can be similar, or? Um, well, I mean, um, um, probably not because, um, um, you know, Jozo Bay is a very simple system, only basically driven by tides and uh, um, GVM uh, B has, um, you know, all the other forcing such as uh, strong river discharge, um, um, you know, monsoons, um, cyclones, and uh, uh, of course, tides as well. Um, so I know that there is um, reclamations and polder constructions there through your work, but I think uh, the picture will be uh, a lot more complex because you have more of those um, natural processes plus all these uh, um, human activities of um, 
um, polder building. Um, so, um, so, so, and it's it's a much larger system as well, right? So, yeah. I think it's a more challenging uh, environment to uh, fully understand the sediment transport uh, dynamics there. But I mean, um, fundamentals would be probably the same. You know, and you have the four things. Um, by these natural forces that are tides, waves, um, currents, and uh, and then you have these um, um, <coughs> uh, deposition geomorphological features. So um, yeah, but but I I'm not sure whether so Jotel Bay has this interesting phenomena of uh, um, reclamation causing uh, its from erosion to deposition. So sediment flux was seaward in you know 70 years ago let's say before reclamation was taking place and then now it becomes landward um, because as i said the gamma or tidal symmetry has changed um mm. so so um but now for um uh gbm b you know you have other forcings like a uh, river and the cyclones there as well. Okay. So I think it's, it's certainly more challenging. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it's uh, almost a one and a half hour. Oh, there's a one more raise hand of Toy, who is uh, Toy. Yeah. If you want to see something, go ahead. Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, Thank you for your speech. I, I want to ask a question uh, with the human activities and the camp. I can't hear uh, very well. Can you speak up? Um, okay, oh, what about now? Um, still very, still very low the volume. Um, Go ahead. Closer to the, <laughs> the computer, maybe that will increase the volume of your... Okay, I will type the question on the chart board. No problem, you go ahead, go ahead. I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so um, I think with the human activities and uh, the CLAM will change, the, will change. I think the land sedimentation will, may also change. Could you tell me what change it? Changes may happen to the land sedimentation. Thanks. I, I can't hear. Um, can you, Paul? Can you, can you hear? Can you repeat? He kind of said the climate change will kind of change the sea level, but uh, how about the land reclamation? Is this what you ask? Yes. Yes. Thank you. You know, oh, okay. the land reclamation. You know, you first. Climate change, sea level rise, the land reclamation, you were loose, right? So, sorry, yeah. say again. Toyo, where, where are you from? Uh, I'm from China. China. China, okay. Um, okay, I, I think, um, well, I mean, I, I actually use this Jiangsu Coast reclamation example to show that. Um, Reclamation change tides and therefore tidal range, so that will change sea level, um, and it changes uh, uh, so fast. <laughs> uh, it happens now, and with the um, the uh, sea level rise due to global warming, change gradually, um, what 1.7 millimeters per year, and it's about maybe 40, uh, 50 centimeters by end of the century. So. So that, but that's um, that's you know a long term um, time scale. Um, so so yeah so so both uh, would actually change the sea level, but I mean the the human activity such as re land reclamation gives you instant uh, change or very uh, a change in very short time scale. Whereas the other one is a long term. So, to my mind, 
you know, if we worry about uh, sea level change, we probably should worry about these uh, sea level change due to land reclamation first. And <laughs> worry about the climate change, um, global sea level rise uh, 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 next, because um, because you know it's it's today rather than you know hundred years uh, time. So 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 really, I always think that. I mean, in our title, um, the climate change is taking place, and we, we, you know, the, the world we need to do something about it um, to at least slow down its change. Uh, but as my example has showed in today's presentation, the human perturbation or human-induced activities can actually change environment much quickly, much more quickly, and perhaps uh, in, a, in a larger extent in comparison with the climate change. So, so I'm a coastal oceanographer, so from my point of view, you know, we need to actually manage our today's activities um, uh, first before we uh, worry about, uh, you know, future. At uh, least, um, you know, I put our put our priorities correct first. But that's just only from my point of view. If you talk to a climate scientist, they probably tell you a different thing. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, and have a day. Thank you. Okay, Xiaohua, I think is uh, now it's uh, just uh, one and a half hour. So thank you so much, you know, for this discussion, a wonderful talk and discussion. So uh, um, this talk is uh, live streamed on the YouTube and recorded on YouTube. So if uh, anybody want to rewatch it, you can go to our YouTube channel and uh, to watch it and you can sign this one to your student to watch it. Okay, Xiaohua, thank you very much. So many of you, if you want to follow us, you can follow us on the Twitter or follow us uh, on our weekly email list. If you want to receive our email notice, just send me an email. Uh, I think we can end it here. Xiaohua, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Paul.